We're going to talk about the speeches of Ronald Reagan, and let's get right into it. Um, in 1980, when Ronald Reagan is elected in November of 1980 president, uh, he ends up succeeding uh, Jimmy Carter. And it's worth saying that uh, President Carter uh, is right now in hospice care, as many of you know. Uh, he's been one of the most important political presences in our society since the late 1970s, uh, first as president for one term, and then, of course, in all of his post-presidential activities, uh, Habitat for Humanity, international election monitoring, all sorts of things uh, of that sort. Ronald Reagan replaces Jimmy Carter after a period in American history that was filled with, shall we say, uh, a lot of disappointment. Uh, among Americans. Uh, the late 1970s is not a period that is generally fondly remembered by Americans. And I will tell you that my students, my 18 to 21 year olds, find it a, a really a period that they snicker about because they identify it with uh, disco and bell bottom jeans and all sorts of strange things uh, like that. As historians, all of us recognize that what the late 1970s represented was a period of difficulty for the American economy. In particular, difficulties surrounding um, the oil dependence of the United States uh, with regard to the Middle East, our dependence upon oil from the Middle East, and the ways in which that dependence left our economy susceptible to high inflationary spikes when Middle Eastern countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and other members of OPEC, use their oil leverage to try to demand higher revenue for their oil and other political goals, in particular goals with regard to Israel and elsewhere that we don't need to talk about in this session. Nonetheless, it was that oil crisis dependence, as it was referred to at the time, that contributed, among other things, to what was a period of stagflation. Stagflation, when, as many of you know, both interest rates and um, inflation both spiked in American society, this was a period of double digit, more than double digit mortgage rates uh, and various other difficulties for American citizens. This is my son who's just come home from high school uh, walking behind me right now. Hello, Zachary. Um, we'll see what he wants to do right now. Uh, so Ronald Reagan uh, came in as a replacement for that in the eyes of many. And I love using Time Magazine covers uh, when I uh, teach because they capture, at least in that moment, they capture the zeitgeist of American society. A time wouldn't be the way we would do that today. We'd probably use Facebook or Twitter or something, but Time Magazine in the Cold War era really did capture some of the American zeitgeist. And here we see Time Magazine, not necessarily endorsing Reagan, but making the case that Reagan's election is a fresh start. It was to be a fresh start for the American economy. It was to be a fresh start for American foreign policy. Carter also had the misfortune of being president at the time when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, at the time of the Iranian Revolution, when the Ayatollah Khomeini and various other groups not always aligned with him overthrew the Shah's regime. And for 444 days, uh, Americans working in the US embassy were held hostage uh, in that embassy by the Iranian revolutionaries. That actually is one of my first political memories. I remember uh, the, the hostage crisis in Iran. I remember the first episodes of what became Nightline with Ted Koppel uh, when that was on and every day, another day in the uh, hostage crisis. And I remember the Reagan election. Uh, and on the day that Reagan was inaugurated president, uh, January 20th, 1981, uh, the Iranian regime released the American hostages. So in some ways, Reagan was fortunate to come into what for no doing of his own, became a, a fresh start. Now, Reagan was a different kind of communicator from Carter. Not only did he represent a response to the times, but he also was a different kind of communicator. Carter was actually much more like most professors, which is to say he was a very cerebral individual, highly educated. He had actually been trained as a nuclear engineer, very detail-oriented. He was what we would call a policy wonk, and he saw his uh, public uh, speeches, his public pronouncements, as a way of educating, informing, in some ways lecturing to the public. And um, he's most um, most famous for giving a number of speeches where he encouraged Americans to wear sweaters and use less energy to keep energy costs down, tried to explain to Americans the complexity of Middle East politics. Um, he was known for being someone who was trying to educate the public, not necessarily inspire the public. And this is not a lecture on Carter, but when I have played speeches or given speeches to students from Jimmy Carter, uh, they don't find them inspirational. They find them impressive in their intellectual depth, 
but not necessarily inspirational. Reagan, of course, came out of a different tradition. He came out of a tradition of entertainment and broadcasting. If Carter came out of a tradition of working in the Navy and being a farmer uh, and then being a governor, Reagan, who of course was a governor too, uh, came out of a broadcasting tradition. Early in his life, soon after graduating Eureka College in Illinois, he made his way to Des Moines, Iowa. And here he is as a young man working in radio. Uh, Ronald Reagan's inspiration was Franklin Roosevelt, uh, the man who really revolutionized radio as a political messaging medium. And if you're teaching the history of communications uh, and the history of the media, uh, Franklin Roosevelt is absolutely a necessary figure. His fireside chats, which I, by the way, still play for students, uh, his fireside chats actually were moments when for the first time, Americans felt a connection to the president that they had never felt before. In oral histories, it, it turns up all the time, people referring to uh, Roosevelt as a hulking father figure, a man who couldn't walk, who actually was distant um, in so many ways, certainly economically for most citizens. They felt he was connected to them as never before because of their radio experience and hearing his soothing voice, hearing his empathetic, calming voice on the radio. Reagan came of age with FDR as his hero. He was a depression baby, Ronald Reagan was. And his first job really was, uh, after being a lifeguard, was working in Des Moines, Iowa on the radio, providing uh, sports updates to people and various other, various other things. From radio, he moved to uh, Los Angeles to try to make a movie career for himself. He, of course, became an actor. Uh, and then after a long movie career, after a career also as a leader of actors uh, activism for better pay, he was a union organizer for actors, the Screen Actors Guild uh, was uh, an organization he was the president of for a time. Uh, he then uh, became a spokesperson for various corporate entities, including General Electric, going around the country giving speeches, then became governor and built an entire career around what some would come to call the speech, which was really a collection of claims about how American society could be better by empowering people. His argument was about getting things out of the way, whether they were poor economic conditions, poor government policies. Uh, he was a new dealer who then became critical of some of the excesses he saw in the 1960s and 70s of US policy, uh, finding ways to empower individuals. And this is important when we go to his presidential speeches, because in some ways he is echoing the script of earlier years time and again. Uh, and it's important for us to see how he was doing this before we analyze uh, some of the speeches here. Um, this is actually in the Reagan um, uh, presidential library these handwritten versions of his speeches in the 1970s in between the time when he was governor of California and president of the United States, he was a continual presence in person around the country uh, on what would be called, you know, the, the chicken dinner circuit uh, and on radio and even on television uh, going around giving speeches and he would write them out by hand himself. Uh, one of the lessons of Reagan's uh, speech making is that it's important to have a script. It's important to have a story you tell over and over again. Repetition is valuable. It's important to be good at delivering it, but it's important to actually be authentic. He was an actor who was authentic at the same time. He believed what he was saying. And that's one of the powers in, in, in his rhetoric. Authenticity, uh, going back to the Greeks, is one of the essential elements of effective public speaking, of effective persuasion and compelling oratory. And, and Reagan, if you read these, this is, this is hard to read in the PowerPoint, but if you go and you read these speeches in his own hand, some have been published too, you can see that he comes back to the same two or three points, right? That American citizens crave freedom and we must do more to empower citizens in their local communities and elsewhere. That actually new technology can be used to support old values. Reagan was a modern conservative, which is to say he embraced conservative values of small town America where he had come from, but he also believed those small town values could be, must be added to technology. He would love the fact that we're doing this by Zoom today. He would love this, right? He would love the fact that we can do good, solid political history and we can do it with new technology, right? That's exactly how Reagan would have thought of the world. The old values with the new technology. Gary Wells wrote a wonderful book just about that point in Reagan's thinking, how he could be both modern and conservative uh, at the same time. And then the third element of Reagan's thinking was anti-communism. Uh, going back to his years in Hollywood, uh, he came to see communism as the opposite 
of the freedom and individuality that he associated with Americanism. And as a former union organizer, he had recognized how dangerous communists were because in his terms, communists challenged what he was trying to do as the head of the Screen Actors Guild, which was to get actors paid more. Communism wanted to pay everyone the same. He wanted to get a situation where actors and created essentially what is the system we have today where actors are not owned by their studios. In the 1950s, when Reagan was in Hollywood, 1940s and 50s, like baseball in Hollywood, actors were owned by the studio. So you'll notice Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, all the stars of the, that period, Reagan himself, always were with the same studio, whether it was Warner Brothers or whoever else it was, MGM. Um, free agency was what the Screen Actors Guild was arguing for, which is the world we have today, where an actor, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, can decide who she wants to work for, who she or he wants to work for movie for movie and get bid up bid up the cost bid up the salary for doing that same way baseball players and, and athletes uh do that today communism was a threat to that so we see these consistent themes and when reagan becomes president he brings these themes into office they're in part how he gets elected and he brings these themes into office we're going to look at three speeches today uh we're going to look at his speech to the national association of evangelicals uh probably his most famous and infamous speech this is the evil empire speech of 1983. Uh, and in each case, we're going to talk, we're going to contextualize the speech and then talk about it and analyze it a little bit. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, the second speech we're going to do, it will be his uh, speech on US Soviet relations in 1984, which is a real turning point. Uh, that second speech that I'll get to after the evangelical speech is the speech that's usually seen as the moment when Reagan takes a turn from hardline around the Soviet Union to reaching out. Uh, the peacemaker Reagan, we start to see there. And then the third speech that we'll look at will be uh, his speech when he visits Moscow in 1988, first time in his life. At the end, the last year of his presidency, last months of his presidency, uh, he visits Moscow, visits his then good friend, Mikhail Gorbachev, recently passed away. Uh, and uh, in 1988, he's in Red Square and he gives a speech at Moscow State University, Moskovsky Gasudarstvena Universitet. Uh, he gives a, a, a speech there in English, in English. Uh, it would be really impressive if he did in Russian, wouldn't it? Uh, he gives a speech there uh, about what he sees as the evolving relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. We obviously aren't going to be able to talk about every word in all these speeches, but what we're going to look at in these speeches, we're going to try to understand how Reagan was able to convey his message, what made him effective in his own time, and what we can learn today. This is not meant to justify or criticize the content of what he says. That's not the point today. I don't actually think that's our point as historians. It's to understand what he said, how he said it, so our students can learn about political communication and about the role of speeches in creating leadership and in conveying leadership uh, in, different, in different times. Okay, so let's let's talk about uh, Reagan's visit to the National Association of Evangelicals in Orlando, Florida. This is March 8th of 1983. Um, this is a very important speech that Reagan is giving. His first few years in office did not go well. The challenges he had from the Carter years carried over. Many of you might remember that in 1982, the United States had a historic high in its unemployment rate. Today, the unemployment rate in the United States is 3.4%. It's lower in Texas than that. In 1982, the unemployment rate for the country was around 12, 13%, and the unemployment rate in Texas was higher than that. So about three times worse than today. Interest rates were still high. This was a very difficult time. Reagan had also ramped up his rhetoric against the Soviet Union. Uh, and he had put a lot of money into building a larger defense establishment. The Soviet Union had responded by doing more of the same. And again, one of my vivid memories as a child, as a young child, I was about eight, nine years old, uh, was not only the um, Iran hostage crisis of 1979, 1979-80, 81, uh, but also in 1982, buying Time magazine and seeing, not that Reagan was a fresh start, but uh, that Reagan and Andropov, Yuri Andropov, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, were seen as uh, men of the year because they were about to blow up the world. Uh, and this was the time of nuclear fears. I also vividly remember in 1983, uh, the movie um, uh, that was shown about what a nuclear war would look like uh, that was shown in, around the country on network television. We were all warned uh, about watching that film, and in 1983, we watched the film, 
And uh, it was a film of a nuclear attack on Lawrence, Kansas, and what a world, no, nuclear war would look like between the United States and the Soviet Union. This was a time of rising nuclear fear, uh, as well as economic difficulty in the United States. Reagan went to the National Association of Evangelicals to try to explain what his presidency was about. And he made the argument that despite the difficulties that the world was facing, his, his presidency was about moral commitment, moral commitment. Reagan was not a religious man. He was the first divorced president. Uh, he did not go to church on weekends. Um, he was not an evangelical. Let's make that clear. And the Republican Party was not dominated by evangelicals at that time. You could argue this at the beginning of that story. Reagan was appealing to evangelicals to make the case that the sacrifices, the difficulties that were coming with his presidency, carrying over from Carter's presidency, were for a moral purpose. Carter would give speeches explaining to people why these sacrifices, why these difficulties were necessary because of the workings of the global economy or because of the workings of geopolitics. He gave professorial explanations, whereas Reagan gave a more inspirational, pastoral, priest-like explanation, which was an explanation about the moral purpose. And of course, the essence of any religious story, any religious parable, is you must suffer to achieve. You must overcome sin before you can reach uh, whatever the heavenly moment is. And that's, in essence, the argument he makes in this speech. He spends a lot of time, for the first time really in his career, talking not just about school prayer, which had been an issue he had raised, and race, which had been an issue he had raised before, but, but now abortion. Uh, Reagan had not been uh, a pro-life, anti-abortion person until around this time. And his speech is actually talking about protecting life and presidents standing up for that. And then, of course, the Soviet Union. And that's the part that we're most concerned with. Uh, my rule, by the way, in general, is not to put up words on a PowerPoint slide, but today, because we're doing this discussion of speeches uh, over Zoom, we'll do a little bit of that, a little bit of reading off a slide. But I want to make a point that this is an exception. This is not generally, I'm someone who's averse to people throwing up words all the time on their slides. I think slides are for images, mouths are for words, right? Slides are for images, mouths are for words in presentations. Actually, books are for words, really, too obviously. Um, okay, so what is Reagan saying in March of 1983? This is, I think, one of the key passages I've pulled out here from the speech, and I encourage you all to read it and reread it if you haven't read it recently. Uh, let me read this section. So I urge you to speak out against those who would place the United States in a position of military and moral inferiority. I urge you to beware of the temptation of pride. If you've read the speech, you know, he cites C.S. Lewis on this. The temptation of blithely declaring yourselves above it all and label both sides equally at fault to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire. That's the Soviet Union. That's the phrase that's taken out of the speech. To simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. What Reagan is saying here at a moment when many are criticizing his nuclear policies, there's actually a nuclear freeze movement in the United States calling for a required freeze on new nuclear construction, new nuclear development by the United States. What Reagan is saying here is that there's a false pride in seeing the two sides as the same. Just as there's a difference between those he wants to argue protect life and those who take life, that's his argument, there's a difference between those who empower people, that would be a democratic capitalist system for him, and those who take power and choice away from people. That's how he terms a communist or, or socialist system. And he's making the case that what he is doing, despite the greater belligerence, despite the greater economic difficulties, is actually about providing, sourcing, defending, a moral purpose, a moral purpose that has been forgotten. He turns things around here, right? Instead of um, falling into the trap of the hubris of thinking the United States can push the world around, which some accused him of believing, he's instead saying that the true pride is those who don't want to recognize the difference between us and them and don't want to defend what we are about. He's not making a case for compromise. He's making a case for the opposite. He's not making a case for war either. He's making a case for a world where one side stands up for what is right. That's what the entire speech is about. He's saying that the Carter years were too much about trying to find explanations 
that lost sight of what was most important, what he sees as American moral purpose. And the power of this rhetoric, if you notice, is that it takes a complex world and it makes it very simple. Maybe too simple for some, but it simplifies. It simplifies. Let me read it again to you. So I urge you to speak out against those who would place the United States in a position of moral and military inferiority. I urge you to beware the temptation of pride. He's saying it's prideful not to see the differences in the world. The temptation of blithely declaring yourself above it all and label both sides equally at fault to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an empire, an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. So there is a struggle between right and wrong, he's saying there is a struggle between good and evil, and it's prideful not to see that. Uh, this, this is the opposite of the rhetoric of detente that had been the rhetoric of American foreign policy, even in the late Carter years during the period of Soviet aggression uh, in Europe, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere. The sense was still that the world was too dangerous for us to actually confront the Soviet Union. Reagan is saying there's a moral purpose. There's a moral purpose in this. He uses key words here that I've underlined, pride, evil empire, struggle between right and wrong, good and evil. Um, most of us as historians would say that this is an oversimplification, not necessarily wrong, but an oversimplification of uh, where we are in the Cold War at that time. Uh, but it's a powerful simplification. Um, and notice also that even though it's drawn a distance, a distinction between the US and the Soviet Union, it actually is bringing all Americans together. Everyone can be under this tent. Everyone can be under this umbrella. The us versus them is not internal, as you would see it in the partisanship of current politics. It's the US versus the Soviet Union. It's the US versus the Soviet Union in this, in this way. Let's go on to the next one. Um, Reagan's efforts to ramp up the moral rhetoric, to some extent work. And um, his language does fit the times. This was a man who had a very good intelligence for the time he was in. He could feel the moment. And in 1984, as the American economy begins to improve um, and as other events help, Reagan's rhetoric actually takes on not only more um, persuasion, but it seems to actually match up with the experiences of the moment as people remember them. This is an image from 1984, Reagan's hyper-patriotism uh, of that moment. Uh, the interesting thing about that hyperpatriotism is it was about the moral arguments that he was making, but he actually wasn't calling for war. He was calling for what he would say would be the preparation for war. Notice that he's not, if I go back to that for a second, he is calling the other side an evil empire, but he's not justifying all kinds of behavior. He's arguing for actually moral rectitude and a morally strong position. He, in his own mind, believed there were limits to that. Not everyone around him recognized what those limits were. In 1984, he benefits enormously from a number of things happening, one of them being the Olympics. 1984, the Soviet Union um, boycotted the Olympics that were held in Los Angeles, the Summer Olympics. They boycotted them because the United States, under Jimmy Carter, had boycotted the 1980 Olympics following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And I remember this very vividly. I was. Um, still a high school student, and no, I wasn't even, uh, I guess I was a late middle school, early high school student. And um, the 1984 Olympics, the United States did better than they'd ever done in some Olympics in a long time, uh, because of, uh, of course, uh, the Soviets weren't there. So we didn't have as much competition. I remember uh, that uh, McDonald's used to give out uh, cards and you could, they give you an event. And if the United States won gold, you got a Big Mac, silver, you got a uh, fries, uh, bronze, you got a free soda. And McDonald's lost a lot of money. And I ate far too much McDonald's that, uh, that summer because I was getting all these free meals as the United States won all these events. There was a sense, there was an upswelling of pride associated with the economy starting to turn around with the Olympics at that moment and Reagan's rhetoric actually playing, playing to that. But the concerns Reagan developed in 1984 and that his pollsters developed were that Americans were beginning to worry that he had become too belligerent. As things turned around, there was a concern that he was becoming too belligerent. And there were a number of events, particularly in 19, late 1983, months after the prior speech that we just went through, that worried lots of Americans. Concerns about the Soviet Union being on higher nuclear alert, 
in late 1983. Concerns that Reagan was actually maybe being a little bit too belligerent. Criticisms coming from other countries, particularly our French and German allies at the time. And so in 1984, in this period for which this picture is taken, Reagan came to the conclusion and his pollsters encouraged him as he was starting to run for re-election uh, that he had to figure out a way to explain to people that he was arguing for moral purpose, but he wasn't as belligerent as his rhetoric could come across. That even though he meant the Soviet was an evil empire, he didn't mean there were limitless things we could do militarily uh, to go to war. That, we, that the, the story of the movie 1983, the day after, about nuclear war was not actually the story of the world he wanted to move into. So he had to persuade the public that he was going to be tough, but that also his toughness was not belligerence and militarism that his toughness actually had a purpose that would get us beyond that uh, for fears that some had that he was too belligerent and too trigger happy. And so that's the story of the 1984 speech uh, that you have uh, in front of you. And uh, again, the 1984 speech, it's much longer than what I have on the slide. And I generally don't like putting up words on the slide, but again, gives, gives us a way to describe it. This section of the speech was largely written in by hand by Reagan. And when returning to this image here, he had a long tradition of writing his speeches by hand. Um, he had, of course, a whole speech writing team. This is not the 1984 speech, uh, but the speech writing team wrote the speech. And as he looked over the speech, as he always did, as he read over it and reprepared it, as any actor would their script, he realized something was missing. And so toward the very end, right before he went to Congress to give the speech, he actually added in a section uh, to the speech. And that's, that's what we uh, have here, uh, this element of the speech. The prior words in the 83 speech were words of his, but they'd actually come from Peggy Noonan and other writers at the time, Michael Donan and, and Peggy Noonan. These were actually uh, his words, his effort to humanize uh, what he was doing. If the first speech was moral preaching, uh, this speech became remembered for its storytelling, not its moral preaching, right? If the first speech was a sermon the, to the evangelicals, which would be appropriate, this was a story he was telling on television now uh, from the uh, wells of Congress, from the well of Congress, telling on television to the American people about what he was about. And let me just read this uh, to you. And if any of you remember Reagan's voice, I'm not going to do Reagan's voice, but you can probably in, in your head hear him saying this. This is not what you would expect Jimmy Carter ever to say, or for that matter, uh, George H.W. Bush. George, George H. Yeah, George H.W. Bush, who was Reagan's vice president and his successor president. Just suppose with me for a moment, Reagan says, that an Yvonne and an Anya could find themselves, oh, say, in a waiting room or sharing a shelter from the rain or a storm with a Jim and Sally. And there was no language barrier to keep them from getting acquainted. Would they then debate the differences between their respective governments? Or would they find themselves comparing notes about their children and what each other did for a living? Before they parted company, they would probably have touched on ambitions and hobbies and what they wanted for their children and problems of making ends meet. And as they went their separate ways, maybe Anya would be saying to Yvonne, wasn't she nice? She also teaches music. Jim would be telling Sally that Ivan didn't, did or didn't like about his, what, what, Ivan, what Ivan did or didn't like about his boss. The the, the, the uh, this is covered by my screen. I apologize. The section here. They might even have decided they were all going to get together for dinner evening dinner some evening soon. Above all, above all, they would have proven that people don't make wars. That people don't make wars. No, this is the kind of. Uh, writing and talking about relations between societies that no nuclear policy or foreign policy expert would ever have written, right? This would be laughed at, right? If you went to the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, I was giving a talk there a few hours ago, actually on Zoom. If you went there and you actually said this, if I talked like this a few hours ago, then this would be laughed at. If you sent this into the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, this would be laughed at, right? This is not how foreign policy experts talk. We expect people to talk about uh, nuclear throwaways. We expect them to talk about deterrence. We expect them to talk about national interest. We expect them to talk about important highfalutin things. Reagan was intentionally going against that. That's not who Reagan was. Uh, 
but he was also intentionally working against that. He was making the case that for all the belligerents, all the fears of nuclear war, all the rhetoric that he himself was spouting about an evil empire, that nonetheless, this was actually about people. And the point of this speech was actually that the problems were not problems between the United States and the Soviet Union. They were problems between the Soviet leadership, he argued, and the free world. And that if the Soviet leadership changed or could be forced to change or could be forced to limit its behavior, that there are ways in which the two societies could get along. He was trying to make a distinction, which he did probably more effective than any president to that time, between the Soviet leadership and the Russian people, between the policies we were opposed to and the people who had to live with those policies in those societies. He was making the case that American policy was not anti-Russian, and he was making the case that American policy was ultimately about peace, even though in the short run, it had ramped up the areas of conflict between people. This was an extraordinary speech because uh, we have the polling data, and it showed that many Americans who viewed Reagan as an unhinged, belligerent president came to see him now as a more grandfatherly figure, which of course he was by age, and they came to see him as more committed to peace. He humanized himself. You know, it's the exact opposite of the prior speech in that sense, and it shows the two purposes that presidents and other leaders can have in speechifying, right? Historically, there is the role in ramping up, right? Getting the juices of the public flowing, getting people organized and hyped up to do something. There's actually too much of that, I think, in our rhetoric today. Hate is one way of doing that. Uh, mobilizing people against a real threat or against an exaggerated threat is a way to get people energized for something. Uh, that's one form of speech giving. Another form is this, which is the use of narrative and story to humanize oneself, to humanize a conflict, to appeal less to the instinct of self-preservation, defense, and fight, but more to the instincts of identification and connection. In this speech, even though there is no Yvonne and Anya who he knows, or, no, or Jim and Sally, in this speech, what he's doing is he's trying to make a connection within the belligerent foreign policy space between these societies and to flagrantly show that he's doing that, to win people over, that he doesn't really want war. He doesn't really want conflict. He's forced to be tough because of the policies of the other side, but yet there's a desire for some human outcome. People see an end. They see a possibility in this. It's very FDR-like, actually. If you go back and read FDR's fireside chats or listen to them, FDR is also using very simple language and telling stories. Uh, his stories tend to be stories that he actually learns about. People bring in, Eleanor and others bring them into the White House, and he's telling stories of actual people. But he's showing what the depression really means. He's showing what the CCC really means to ordinary people. He's not making a policy speech about the importance of civilian conservation. He's making a speech about how the Civilian Conservation Corps or the National Banking Act or the Federal Reserve, or the FDIC Act is actually changing people's lives, how it's bringing people together. Let me read it one more time and maybe we can hear that uh, even more uh, now after, after uh, this discussion a little bit. Just suppose with me for a moment that an Yvonne and an Anya could find themselves, oh, say in a waiting room or sharing a shelter from the rain or a storm with a Jim and Sally and there was no language barrier to keep them from getting acquainted. Would they then debate the differences between their respective governments? Of course not. That's what egghead intellectuals like I do. Or would they find themselves comparing notes about their children and what each other did for a living? That's what ordinary people do, right? Before they parted company, they would probably have touched on ambitions and hobbies and what they wanted for their children and problems of making ends meet. And as they went their separate ways, Maybe Anya would be saying to Yvonne, wasn't she nice? She also teaches music. Or Jim would be telling Sally, he would be telling Sally, uh, where am I? What, what Ivan did or didn't like about his boss. They might even have decided they were all going to get together for dinner some evening soon. Above all, they would have proven that people don't make wars, that people don't make wars. It's actually simple and compelling. Sometimes the simplest stories are the most compelling. It's believable. 
we can all identify with it uh, in one way uh, or another. Th this is the moment actually that many historians argue Reagan begins to make a turn because he actually believes his own rhetoric. He believes that he has used the first part of his presidency to deal with the economic difficulties of the time. He's tried to lower taxes and increase spending to deal with the economic problems of the 70s. And he's increased the American defense budget. He's increased the American defense establishment. He's increased our nuclear arsenal. He believes the United States is stronger now. Historians argue over whether that is accurate or not accurate. But Reagan believes it. And he believes that now that he's stronger, now the United States is stronger, it's in a position to deter bad Soviet behavior, to deter the evil empire, as he promised in 1983, and ready to reach out. And what the archive shows, what the record shows, is that Reagan actually does begin to do that. He sends repeated letters to the Soviet leadership, and he's asked uh, in the 84 election why he hasn't actually been successful in connecting. He has no meetings with any Soviet leaders in his first term. Uh, is that his fault? Is that because he's too belligerent? And he says, no, you see, I, I, look what I said. I'm reaching out to them. Um, but he says they keep dying on me, right? The Soviet leadership goes through uh, three deaths in the 82 to 84 period, right? First one is, of course, Leonid Brezhnev, who had been the leader of the Soviet Union for uh, more than a decade, almost two decades. Then uh, Yuri Andropov, then Konstantin Chunyenko, who was barely leader before he passed away. These were all old Bolsheviks uh, who were next in line, who died off. And then in 1985, we would finally get um, a new younger leader in the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Reagan did not bring Gorbachev to power. And Reagan was fortunate that Gorbachev came to power. But what has to be said is that for all of his belligerence in 83, Reagan was using his words in 84 and 85, not to back away from what he had said, but to try to humanize. You can be tough and strong and you can still humanize your enemy. We have forgotten that in our society today. Part of being civil, part of being part of a community where you treat people respect with respect is not giving up your moral vision, your moral beliefs. We are a society in the United States that throughout our history, from the time Alexis de Tocqueville visited in the 1820s to the present, we are a society that has been filled with very religious people with very strong moral claims. Christians, Jews, Muslims, Mormons, all kinds of groups, Hindus, uh, all kinds of groups of individuals with all kinds of serious religious beliefs. That is not new today at all. But that religion went side by side with a recognition that those who did not share one's point of view were not unhuman because of that. We dehumanize people by race. We generally did not dehumanize people because of their belief structure. And today we have to some extent forgotten that Reagan can remind us, and he can remind us from the right to some extent, right? That actually one can have contrary moral visions and stick strongly to one's own moral vision without dehumanizing. In fact, you can still humanize the other side as he did in that speech. Through, through storytelling, through storytelling. Gorbachev comes along and Reagan is willing, Reagan is willing to treat him as a possible partner. Uh, most of Reagan's um, foreign policy experts say uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is a younger Soviet leader. He's more committed to the Soviet system. He's gonna be more of a threat, more of a challenge for you than the old doddering guys you had. Um, but Reagan, though he knows very little about Gorbachev, Reagan is willing to try to humanize and I'm going to be, be clear as I go forward here, Reagan did not end the Cold War, Reagan did not win the Cold War, it was not Reagan who forced Gorbachev to do anything, but it was Reagan who was willing to reach out to Gorbachev when Gorbachev was trying to reform the Soviet Union. And Reagan might have encouraged Gorbachev to do more of what he was doing. Gorbachev uh, embarked on a policy uh, or a set of political reforms and economic reforms in the Soviet Union. Uh, Gorbachev, as the young replacement in his 50s to men who had been in their 70s and 80s, uh, and a believer in the Soviet system, believed that the old guys before him had messed it up. This is often what happens when the young guys come in, right? The young guy, women and men come in, they have to fix the, dirt, the, the mistakes of their predecessors, right? Um, Gorbachev believes, first of all, the Soviet Union needs to accelerate its ability to produce things. It's fallen behind. So his first period in office is this period of uskarenia, 
increasing production, trying to get more done. He realizes as he tries to do that, as he tries to increase what the Soviet Union produces, it, the story had been, the joke had been in the Soviet Union before Gorbachev, we pretend to work and you pretend to pay us. Now Gorbachev says, no, no, we really need to work. When that doesn't work, he realizes that what's getting in the way is the corruption. People aren't getting things done because it's corrupt. So he wants a period of glasnost. Some many of you might remember that phrase, glasnost, uh, opening up the system. And the idea is to open up the system to get more transparency so we can see where the corruption is and get the corrupt guys out. And he starts purging, getting rid of old people, old leaders, old industry heads. Um, but when that doesn't work, he then goes to restructuring, perestroika. And perestroika is designed to actually reform and change the institutions. He starts beginning to think about incentives. He looks at what Sweden and other Scandinavian countries do to try to find some hybrid. Can he incentivize good behavior? Can we get away from military spending? That's the key part. Can we spend less on the military? Can we do more in other areas to get the economy going? And that's the moment when Gorbachev is really starting to reach out to Reagan. And Reagan from 86 on is in a position of wanting to humanize the other side and willing to take some risks. Gorbachev is taking the biggest risks by trying to reform the system. Reagan, despite his advisors, is trying now, even though he still sees it as an evil empire, to do what he says in the Ivan and Anya story, to build a relationship, to find a way to move forward. He's true to his rhetoric as such. And this will lead at, to some arms control discussions that lead to the first reductions, serious reductions in nuclear weapons. And it will lead to a set of uh, meetings uh, and what ends up becoming a very strong personal relationship between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And in 1988, Reagan visits, uh, the Soviet Union visits Red Square. And, and I mean, this is, this is not anything anyone would have predicted a few years earlier. And it's interesting what he says when he goes there. When he goes, he's asked, is this still the evil empire? And he says that was a different time and a different place. Instead, he says something different. You have this speech. There's also attached to the speech, I hope in the version you have, his Q&A with students at Moskovsky Gasudasvodna University, which is unheard of for the American president to go and have Q&A with uh, Soviet uh, citizens. Um, I was gosh, 16 at the time that this was happening. I remember watching this and thinking, uh, th this is a world I never could have imagined five years uh, earlier. Here's uh, what Reagan says. But I hope you know, this is after a period in the speech, if you read it, where he talks about the importance of freedom, free enterprise, all of the old script, all of those things in the handwritten speeches from the 1970s and the speeches in the 60s, it's all the same stuff. Um, and then he says, but I hope you know, I go on about these things, not simply to extol the virtues of my country, but to speak to the true greatness of the heart and soul of your land. Who, after all, needs to tell the land of Dostoevsky about the quest for truth, the home of Kandinsky and Skriabin about imagination, the rich and noble culture of the Uzbek man of letters, Alisher Navoy, about beauty and heart. The great culture of your diverse land speaks with a glowing passion to all humanity. That's a long way from the evil empire, isn't it? He's gone to their society and Reagan is no expert on Dostoevsky or Kandinsky or Skriabin. He's gone to their society and he is extolling what he believes, but he's paying them the most profound of respect, most profound kind of respect. Uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, this is really important, is the opposite of the image of Reagan saying to Gorbachev, tear down this wall and bullying him. This is the opposite of bullying. He's going into their house and in their house, he's validating who they are as he's trying to change them. He's validating who they are as he's trying to change them. This passage is one of the passages from the speech that gets reprinted all over the Soviet Union. They don't print as much of what he says about freedom in American society, but this, this. And notice that none of this justifies Soviet misdeeds as Reagan sees them. It's about something deeper, right? He's talking about a Russian soul as he sees it. 
So he still says the Soviet leadership is an evil empire, or it has those elements, even though it's from a different time and a different space, but he's willing to invest in building this relationship here. And he's paying them that respect. Part of how the Cold War ends is when the two societies, the United States and the Soviet Union, and our respective allies come to fear each other a little less, come to fear each other a little less. Let me read this passage again, because it's actually a beautiful passage. But I hope you know, I go on about these things, the virtues of American society that he's talked about, not simply to extol the virtues of my own country, but to speak to the true, true greatness of the heart and soul of your land. Who, after all, needs to tell the land of Dostoevsky about the quest for truth, the home of Kandinsky and Skriabin about imagination, the rich and noble culture of the Uzbek man of letters, Alicia Navoy, about beauty and heart. The great culture of your diverse land speaks with a glowing passion to all humanity. A glowing passion to all humanity. He is validating who they are, embracing change, but embracing change in a way that is deeply respectful and empathetic. It is the opposite of the image of the tough bullying guy. I, I would want to make the case as a historian that that rhetoric, the tough bullying rhetoric, rarely works. It sounds good. It appeals to a group of people for a short time, but it changes no one. A moral vision, the 83 speech, can charge someone up, can motivate people, but they're motivated for a moral vision, not to bully someone else. A speech like the 84 speech that tells a story can humanize a difficult situation and help you to remember where people are in their space and time. And then empathy, which, is, which was Roosevelt's secret, Franklin Roosevelt's secret, empathy makes people trust and embrace change in ways they wouldn't otherwise. That's everything that Franklin Roosevelt was doing, which was exactly what Reagan was learning. Uh, those who listen to Roosevelt 40 years before this would say, uh, he made me feel like I was heard. In our words today, they'd say he made me feel seen. He made me feel seen. Reagan is helping the Russian people to feel seen in the changes he's calling for. He's not shoving it down their throats. He's not telling them they're wrong or stupid or wasted their lives. He's telling them that they're actually seen in who they are and they can be more of who they are through change and reform. Just as Roosevelt 40 years earlier was telling Americans they could be more of who they are through change and reform in one way or another. Reagan is mixing together morality, a vision of how the world ought to work with storytelling, a way of making that vision less than a sermon on a hill and more of something that people can feel, that people can be a part of, and providing the empathy that allows for trust, for people to feel seen in that, to feel that they are not being forced into this, but they are part of it, right? It's empowering them. It's directing, it's connecting, and it's empowering. It's directing, it's connecting, and it's empowering. And, and, and there's gotta be a desire to do that. But I think the real reason Reagan is able to do this is because that's exactly what Hollywood does in its best moments. That's exactly, right? The best movies are a morality tale with a story that you connect to, where there's empathy. He cites in uh, one of his speeches that you're reading, I believe it's in the uh, 80, 88 speech, um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. All his uh, speeches are filled with movie references, right? That's what he sees, right? Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They're outlaws, but they have a moral vision that we buy into, right? They have a story that's compelling and we kind of empathize. We empathize uh, with them, right? It is actually the value and way in which you persuade someone. Tell them what you're about, make them feel they're part of it, make them break down the barriers to distrust and feel connected to you, right? That's, that's actually the genius of Reagan's speeches. That's what makes him a great communicator. It's not fancy words. Uh, it's not always the eloquence. It's not even the delivery. It is the way it's received, the way it's received. And you know the difference even to this day, whether you like Reagan or not, and I have mixed feelings about him, obviously, uh, but you know it when you play those speeches, even for students today, 
And you know it when you compare it to some of the horrible rhetoric that people are uh, exposed to today. You know it and you see the difference. We've just articulated that. We've used Reagan in a sense as a way of understanding communication through that, through that.